Okay, it's uh, four o'clock in the afternoon in Germany. We'd like to start this um, um, session, the SICON session. Hello, everybody, and um, welcome to our session today, our SICON session. This will be a back best practice session about foundation-based financing of science journalism. It will be presented by three editors-in-chief, namely, um, we have Deborah Bloom from Undark. Hello, very nice to meet you. It's a great pleasure to have you here from the US. And um, Thomas Lynn from Quanta Magazine and um, Volker Stollertz from the Science Media Center. Welcome, all of you. Um, my name is Christina Zatori. I'm a freelance science journalist and I will be the host of this Zoom session. Um, just briefly, SICON discusses the future of science journalism from an international perspective. So we are looking for ideas, perspectives, experiences, models. Uh, we already had six lectures about different aspects. They took already place. But today is not only the last online session if on this, if of this year, but it's also the first best practice session of SICON that we have. Um, before we start, let me give you uh, briefly uh, just a small background um, for SICON. SICON was created by the Wissenschaftspressekonferenz, WPK, that's um, German Science Journalists Association, and the um, Deutsche Akademie für Technikwissenschaften, ACATEC, that's National Academy of Science and Engineering, and SICON is funded by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research, BMBF. And um, in the name of SICOM, I'd like to thank the BMBF for its support. Um, due to Corona, SICOM is organized in a two-pronged strategy. So first, uh, there are online lectures and sessions like this one with international speakers. Every lecture and session will be recorded and transcribed so that we can create a reservoir of knowledge and you find this and all the lectures we already had on the SICON website. And the SICON website you find under science-journalism.eu. And there you find another, uh, a lot of other information too about SICON. So please be aware that uh, by participating in, in this session today, you accept that we will record and transcribe the whole meeting and eventually you and your question afterwards. Um, thank you for um, accepting this. The second part of SICON will be um, an actual meeting. So no, no virtual thing, no online um, session. It will be really taking place in Germany, in Freiburg next year in May. Uh, that will be a working conference. So this is the second part of the um, strategy. And today we want to take a closer look at the role that foundations play. Also how do they shape the transformation of journalism? As I told you, we have three editors in chief here today. They are going to present their media, um, especially their financial concepts. And afterwards, there will be um, some time for questions of understanding and a panel discussion about the different types of financing. So I'd like to start, um, ladies first, with Deborah Bloom. Hello again. <laughs> um, Deborah Bloom won a Pulitzer Prize. She is director of the Night Science Journalism Program at MIT in the US, and she is the publisher of Undark Magazine. She founded this um, Undark Magazine together with the former New York Times journalist Tom Teller. Tom Zeller Jr. in 2016. Um, Undark Magazine is a non-profit online publication exploring science and, um, and here I have to quote, um, frequently wondrous, sometimes contentious and occasionally troubling byproduct of human culture. And the publication's tech line is, this I like a lot, um, truth, beauty and science. Everything else there is to know about Undark Magazine and its financial foundation will Abra Bloom present now herself. So um, if you'd like to you start your presentation, please. Yes, thanks so much, Christina. And it's a pleasure to be here, everyone. I'm going to screen share um, now and so uh and slightly repeating what you just said so undark was uh organized by tom zeller and i we were the only two people working on it uh starting in 2015 and at that point i had just started as director of ksj and i was interested in publishing uh, a magazine that would be a home for good science journalism um and i should explain our funding model 
a little bit here. It's a simple funding model in which we, I pay for the magazine. Um, the Night Science Journalism Program is, lives on an endowment that was created by the James L. and John S. Knight Foundation in the 1980s. And I decided when I became director to take a portion of the income from that endowment to start this magazine. And so one of the things I should explain that we figured out when we were starting was the title of the magazine, Undark. And Undark was the name, the trade name of radium-based luminous paint in the 1920s, which turned out to precipitate one of the great occupational health crises in the United States uh, and became the model of the first uncontrolled exposure to radioactive materials in the workplace. And so UNDARC, we picked the name because it is about science and in both light and dark, but it's also, uh, you know, from a moment in history that really I think illustrates some of the tension between science and society. And so one of the things we decided early is that that was where our magazine would sit. It would have this unique niche. We would not do gee whiz, beautiful science. We would really explore that kind of push and pull between science and society and the way one or the other influences each other. So this is image I'm showing you here is from a series, an international series we did on particulate pollution. It was called Breathtaking. It focused on uh, two, uh, PM 2.5 pollution in particular. If you went and looked at that on our website now, you would see that we're still showing live readings from the seven places in the world that we um, sent reporters and photographers to to cover this. We take a similar approach in the United States uh, and, um, and abroad. Uh, most of our copy is freelance written, as you see here in this uh, story from Afghanistan. Um, our, our staff looks something like this. We have um, several staffers at the Night Science Journalism Program who are hybrid. They work both for the um, UNDARC and for the program. We have several who are full-time dedicated to the magazine. And then we have a, a quite large network of freelance editors, writers, contributing writers, and fact checkers. And one of the things we also decided early is that we would try to be both a home for this kind of serious science journalism, but also for integrity of story. So the actual first staffer that Tom and I hired was a fact checker. And we have since made that one of the models of the program. We are a, uh, a, one of the questions that I was asked is how these nonprofit models are accepted by other mainstream publications. So I wanted to put up here a list of all the publications that we partner with at Undark. Uh, Undark is what you call a steal our stuff model. We're foundation funded. We don't take advertising. We don't need money and we don't charge for our articles. So there's actually a republish button on our website in which anyone can just come to Undark if they choose and republish the story wherever they wanna publish it. But we also work in partnership with a wide variety of other publications. And I've listed some of them here in this slide. Um, we're actually working on a, a project right now with Scientific American, which is funded by the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting, and, um, and that will be a, an actual deliberate co-publish. Some of these are just examples of places who have picked up our work. And it doesn't actually mention everything that we do. One of the things we do is we try to get our stories out of the big national markets and into regional and local publications because that's an audience that's really underserved by science journalism. So we've also had front page stories at the Las Vegas paper and in papers in Costa Rica, uh, depending on what we're writing about. We, uh, another example, I think, of how seriously these nonprofit magazines can be taken is the awards that they win. And I've put up some 
of the awards that Undark has won in the four years that it's been publishing. We actually planned it in 2015 and launched it in 2016. And so you'll see here a, a wide variety of awards for different work that we've done. The Endocrine Society Award down at the bottom right was actually won by me for a, a story I did on the health effects of uh, soy formula for babies. Um, I wanted to briefly show you a little data, mostly focused on growth of the magazine. So if you go back to January 2017 here, you'll see that our monthly page views started at about 66,000. And if you come up here to 2020, you'll see that we uh, average about 500,000 a month now. This does not include all the page views from um, the other publications that publish our work, but this is simply unique visitors to Undark. And if you look at 2020, what you'll see is, um, you know, a, a real peak in the height of the COVID-19 pandemic in the spring, going down in the summer, starting to come back up actually as COVID comes back up in the fall. I'm not advocating for COVID-19 as a driver of readership, but you know, it certainly has driven a lot of audiences as we've moved forward. But the most important thing on this slide, I think, is the amount of growth we've experienced in the last three years. Um, and you'll see the same thing here, looking at our social media, social audience growth. This chart shows Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Flipboard, and our newsletter, and you'll see in all cases, it's a steady upward trend for us. Finally, I want to mention that um, this is a um, team effort on, for all of us. I think I mentioned that uh, in the award thing that although I'm publisher, I'm not editor in chief, that's Tom Zeller. And I'm not a, a staffer of the magazine. I pitch in at the magazine as needed. I've done some narrative editing there. And I also uh, contribute to this. Uh, Abstracts is our uh, weekly roundup of science news. So it's actually the main sort of introductory part of that is written by one of our staff writers, Michael Schulson, but every member of the KSJ staff, including our program assistant, pitches in on abstracts and writes a uh, 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 one of the news items in it. And I actually do this every single week myself because we do see this as both a independent magazine. It is independent from MIT. Uh, MIT does not direct this magazine in any way in the same way that KSJ is an independent science journalism program at MIT and does not receive any funding from MIT. Um, and you would see that with all the other night programs, by the way, the Neemans at Harvard, the JSK at Stanford, they do not receive funding from the university. They are funded and endowed by the Knight Foundation. So we keep this independent, but we also recognize that it's part of the mission of the Knight Science Journalism Program, which is to raise the bar we hope on good science journalism um, and, and give it a good home and provide examples of what we think is important about science journalism in, in this magazine, which is why we all write for it. Uh, I should finally say that, you know, I'm not sure how easily our model translates. There are other publications in the United States that are funded directly by foundations. Um, and obviously Quanta being one of those or uh, Knowable being funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, but we're funded by me, <laughs> right? And, and it's a decision by me at the Night Science Journalism Program. It was not a decision of the Knight Foundation. And that makes us a sustainable model as long as I'm director of the Knight Science Journalism Program, right? It, I'm hoping that we have built something that the next director will want to continue, but I also recognize and hope 
that the next director will have their own vision for the program, which may or may not include a magazine like this. So that's also one of the uh, downsides of foundation funding. And we've certainly seen that in the United States and publications like uh, Pacific Standard in which the foundation decided they were gonna move on to something else. So anyway, I hope this has given you a sense of Undark and what we do, and I'm happy at the appropriate time to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, you did check a lot of points that we asked you before. <laughs> and wonderful, <laughs> wonderful pictures, by the way. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Thank you for all the information. And I'd like to go directly to the um, next speaker, which is Thomas Lund. Hello again, and um, welcome. He is a former New York Times journalist, and now he is editor-in-chief and the founder of Quanta Magazine. Quanta Magazine was launched in 2012. It's an online publication of the Simons Foundation, and it covers developments in physics, mathematics, biology, and computer science. The articles are freely available to read online, and um, several publications like Scientific American, Wired, uh, The Atlantic and The Washington Post, as well as international science publications have reprinted um, articles from Quanta magazine. How this works and how this is financed, um, more about this financial situation of Quanta magazine, we'd like to hear now directly from Thomas Lynn, if you'd like to go ahead, please. Sure, great. Uh Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm very happy to, to join everyone and to uh, talk a little bit about Quanta. Uh, so uh, some of this may actually uh, sound similar uh, to, to what Deborah was just talking about because we're both uh, foundation funded in, in some sense, even though she's more of a funder, I suppose, and I'm the editor in chief of, of this magazine. So I had to propose this magazine and get it funded. Um, but uh, so Quanta is, as um, Christina was just saying, a uh, nonprofit foundation funded editorially independent uh, science uh, and math magazine that focuses on areas of uh, fundamental research that, let me just see if I can advance this, um, that mainstream uh, newspapers and, and, and other science uh, publications tend not to cover as much. I mean, because some of these areas of basic research and mathematics don't necessarily have that direct connection to people's everyday lives. They're not um, necessarily going to be applications right away, but it's much more about um, examining, um, you know, what reality is, what uh, the universe is made of, um, answering some of those big um, questions we have just to uh, gain more knowledge first, and then eventually, maybe decades down the line, there will be some, uh, in fact, all of the technology that we enjoy today started as uh, basic research uh, many years uh, and perhaps decades ago. And so uh, my thinking in proposing this uh, to the Simons Foundation uh, in 2012 was to create a magazine and, and fill, uh, I think, what was a, a gap in this area of coverage of, of more fundamental research and also, like, like Deborah, like Undark, to try to model what um, high quality, in-depth, accurate science journalism could be. Because um, I think if you look out there, there it's, it's a mix, right? There, there, there's some, some, some very solid, long-time uh, uh, science sections of, of newspapers, for example, like the New York Times, um, and, and you know, magazines like Scientific American that have been doing uh, great science journalism for many, many years. Uh, but there's also, I think, uh, places that do uh, less well in terms of, uh, of, of providing uh, meaningful, accurate uh, science coverage. And so uh, part of this is to also provide uh, somewhat of a proof of concept that, that both that uh, this can be done um, in a way that both the public and scientists will trust and also that uh, to show that there really is an audience for this type of uh, this type of journalism, and and so our, our main goals are to uh, make uh, what otherwise would be very inaccessible areas of science and math accessible to the public and to, to allow people to be informed about what's happening in these areas, and at the same time to hopefully sort of lead and show that a, a different model for for science journalism is possible. 
<clears throat> Sorry, I'm just trying to advance this. Oh, okay. And so uh, this is just one of uh, our stories, just to give an example of uh, a, a math piece uh, that we published this year, which in fact was our most popular story of this uh, particular year. And I think it's been viewed something like 670,000 times. Um, it's about the uh, Conway knot problem and a, a graduate student uh, who uh, is, is very advanced for, for where she is, I guess, in terms of her career, um, was able to solve this, this long-standing problem that uh, uh, got a lot of people excited and, and she ended up winning uh, uh, one of the uh, junior breakthrough prizes this year as well. So um, that was uh, a great story that, uh, that is a good example of the kind of journalism that we do. Uh, in terms of funding, so we are a foundation-based um, publication and an example of uh, what you might call philanthropic journalism. And that's a little different than I think some places that uh, either, uh, pr uh, either apply for grants or try to get funding from a variety of sources. And so how this came about, and, and so I, I think this is not too common of, of a model. There are one or two other places uh, that I'm aware of, like uh, Kaiser Health News, for example, uh, also is a foundation-based uh, publication. Um, but how this came about was really that I was at the New York Times and, and uh, I had the opportunity to go work at the Simons Foundation as a journalist to produce editorially independent science articles. And, but in my mind, I was thinking, okay, maybe we can do something more. Uh, when I got there, uh, I proposed a, a much uh, bigger project of creating a magazine uh, like Quanta and was fortunate enough to have uh, people who also cared enough about uh, trying to make these areas of, of uh, science and math more accessible to people um, that there was an opportunity to, to at least give this a try. So it wasn't that at the beginning that anyone said here, you know, just here's, you know, this whole big budget and, and create this, you know, fully fledged magazine. It was much more uh, having to, to prove it uh, sort of from the beginning with a very, very small staff and, and then building it up. And really the, what I liked about that model though uh, is that it was very much based on the quality and impact of the journalism that we were pro uh, producing. And, and that uh, for me was, was all you can really ask for, I think in, in terms of um, having somebody give you a chance uh, to build something like this. And so we, we have a single source of funding, just one foundation. We're actual, actually employees of uh, the Simons Foundation. Um, uh, the, one of the benefits of that is that all of the resources uh, that we have are invested in the journalism itself. We don't have to worry about trying to you know, get advertising or to, you know, um, to, to do some of the other things that, uh, that um, commercial publications have to do. Um, it also means that we're free from any kinds of potential um, you know, strings that might be, um, you know, that might affect uh, or, or coverage, which doesn't happen at the best places, but, but in some, some uh, publications that could be an issue as well. So we're, we're free of that. Uh, at the same time, we're fortunate to be in a position where, um, and this is something that was a condition for me to even work at the foundation, was that I could uh, do independent journalism. It was something that I, I was, um, not interested in, in um, going, going into PR or communications or anything like that. So, uh, so this is something that required a lot of discussion and communication early on, because one thing I've, I've noticed um, is that, uh, and it's completely reasonable and, and not surprising, but that people outside of journalism um, don't necessarily, and there's no reason why they would understand what, well, what journalism is at all, but what journalistic independence really means. And, and I think people in, uh, the sciences don't really know what that means or why it's important. And, you know, I think the perception can be, well, hey, you know, we're, we're scientists, we're trying to be honest, we're, we're providing all this, you know, uh, honest information about our work. Uh, why does there need to be this sort of independent, all these layers of, of uh, uh, distance uh, between the journalists and, and, uh, and the subjects? And, 
you know, I come from, again, the background of, of the New York Times where um, that's crucial to, to be able to produce uh, trustworthy journalism. And, and so that was a lot of the early um, uh, time in terms of gaining that trust, making sure, and also I'll say that scientists in general don't trust journalists for, for the most part um, because of what they see out there, because they see uh, coverage that's often misleading or that um, doesn't quite get it right or that sensationalizes, or, you know, there's just, there's lots of sort of complaints that, that you get from, from scientists. And so um, our goal here was to produce independent journalism, but to sort of, to get it right and, and to, to capture it in a, in a more nuanced way and also show how science is really done. And I think uh, both the public and the scientific community have, have really appreciated that. And so an important piece of this is, I'm just make sure where we are on, on time. Oops. Uh, is, is that uh, we are able to produce uh, our, our journalism uh, with no interference uh, whatsoever from, from, from the funders. Um, and it's really just based on, again, the, the quality and impact. And that's why it's important, I think, uh, if you're going to try to do a project like this to, to be able to find um, specific metrics and measures for, uh, for success. You need to be able to agree with a funder on what does success look like and how we measure it. Are there uh, both qualitative and quantitative measures uh, for what that looks like? Um, we currently have a, a staff, a wonderful staff of 12, including me at Quanta Magazine, but it wasn't always this way. Again, we started very small. It was just, you know, I, it was just me at first, then hired, you know, one writer. And then for the first couple of years, we had a staff of about three. Then for the next few years, we had a staff of about five. And only more recently, the last few years, um, have we grown up uh, to uh, the current staffing? And I think, you know, in terms of whether we'd want to expand further or not, um, that's certainly a possibility. But I, I will say that I'm not in favor of growth for growth's sake. I mean, I think it's important to um, just for me to, to stay uh, as lean and, and efficient and nimble as possible, because I think uh, part of this is, is sustainability. I think it's very important to be able to say and to show funders that you're having this much impact uh, for you know, this much expenditure. And I think it, uh, it's easier to do if you sort of um, grow and also to grow, I think, with a lot of um, self-examination and, and to be able to look after every few years to say, okay, what things are going well? What things should we continue doing? What things should we maybe cut back on before thinking about, because I think you can improve without expanding also. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> am I going long? Okay. No, it's okay now, but if you end. Uh, exactly. I will wrap it, I'll wrap things up. Thanks. What, one just quick note in terms of um, being able to measure um, uh, impact. Again, there's, there's the quantitative, you want to be able to reach a lot of people. So you look at your numbers, the traffic and, and, and unique visitors. I have a, a uh, it's not working very well. Uh, this is a, a chart showing growth from 2012. Obviously we were at you know, basically zero at the beginning. This year uh, we'll have something like 13 million uh, readers and, and probably around 30 million page views for the year. Um, we go back, this is kind of a, we did a reader survey recently where uh, we had 6,000 responses. And it's kind of, this is one of the interesting questions in the survey where we asked people if they thought most science journalism they saw was accurate, fair, and useful, uh, they gave uh, that a rating of seven uh, the resp respondents. And then we asked if they thought quanta was accurate, fair, and useful, and uh, we got an 8.9. So that just showed that, you know, at least in terms of the, the qualitative sense of, of whether we were um, pr producing the kind of accurate, fair, and useful journalism um, that our readers felt was, you know, supported that, that idea. And then also, you know, this a few awards this year, very nice to, to get those, of course, and just to again, for the kind of, of uh, sort of more niche area of science journalism that we uh, do to, to have some mainstream awards like the National Magazine Award for General Excellence this year was, was, was a huge, um, just a big honor, I think, for the, for the entire team. And I just had a few recommendations for, for anybody. I mean, I, again, I think our model is, is quite unique in a way, but I think it's very important to both know your audience and to know your funders, to ask yourself, you know, why should a funder uh, support your project, right? Look to think of things from their perspective, 
um, to obviously demonstrate your ability to execute on that vision, to learn the business side in addition to the journalism side, and, and also, again, to, to know and, and share metrics for, for success. We have syndication partners. I'll leave it at that because I know I'm sort of out of time. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you. We'll come to the questions um, later. Thank you very much um, for this insight. And um, we go directly to um, last but not least, Volker Stolotz from um, the Science Media Center. Um, he's a science journalist. He wrote for major newspapers in Germany, for example, Die Zeit, Die Woche, Frankfurter Allgemeine Sonntagszeitung. Volker Stolotz is chief editor and managing director of the Science Media Center Germany since it was founded in 2015. Uh, the um, Science Media Center, SMC, um, in short, um, bundles information for journalists on current and socially relevant science topics, and it makes available the exp expertise of over 600 selected scientists. It was funded with startup funding from the Klaus Chira Foundation, and um, it pursues a multi-funder model. What that means and how this works, um, we'd like to hear from Volker Stolitz now directly. Uh, if you'd like to start now, Volker, please. Yeah, can you see my presentation? Yes, we do. Uh, well, I do, at least. Yeah. For the invitation, um, uh, I wanted to say a few words about uh, who we are. So the Science Media Center is basically a nonprofit and editorial, completely independent intermediary institution. We were actually founded out of the German Association of Science Journalists, the VPK, who's also kind of hosting this whole uh, project. So there's a very productive uh, relationship between the community and science journalists and the Science Media Center. And our aim is to support journalists from all beats when reporting on topics where scientific expertise can make a difference. That's basically the general rule. We have uh, several products we produce, uh, rapid reaction, research in context on embargoed science. So we uh, collect independent experts' comments on paper who are still under embargo, published in major uh, science journals. We do fact sheets and we do also uh, virtual press briefings where scientists can directly receive questions from the registered journalist with us. And at the moment, we have around uh, 1,300 journalists registered with our center. And we also, uh, very important is that we don't produce finished journalistic reports. So we try to help the journalists uh, uh, to make their reporting uh, better or including uh, scientific experts and expertise, but we don't write finished uh, reports. And what we also have as an innovation lab is the Science Media Lab, where we kind of develop tools to kind of stem the scientific information overload. So how can you scan and evaluate scientific pub uh, publications? How can you develop tools for non-expert journalists to find experts in a certain knowledge domain and these kinds of things? So that's our innovation lab. Um, the funding concept, basically it came uh, about when I personally met uh, the founder of the Klaus Tira Foundation. He's a uh, one of the founders of the uh, European software company, SAP. And I uh, got to know him personally and uh, were able to present him, like uh, Thomas was saying, basically the concept of a science journalist run uh, science media center. There are other science media centers in the world, but we are the one who was basically grounded out of science journalism itself. And so the model was that the Klaus Tira Foundation uh, would uh, fund an experimental uh, period up to five years. And then we would, would seek additional funders and uh, create kind of a balanced structure that we get uh, many, as many sponsors as possible from different areas, science, business, and media. Uh, contributions uh, should be limited. And um, uh, then uh, we have two ways uh, where you can uh, fund us, and one is a membership fee in our association of friends of the SMC, or you can make a donation. And uh, we also, uh, with our SMC lab, will get additional research funding with scientists together and work on new projects and get third-party funding. And we publish all the sponsors and everything uh, we get on our, our website. I will come to the amount of money later. Uh, but with any new funder we take on board or any new sponsor, we kind of do a uh, risk analysis because of course, as you heard already, I see, as I see it, we have basically three risks if we get funded by a foundation or a sponsor or by anybody. 
And uh, one is we can lose our independence uh, and we can lose our reputation, which is a different thing. So if I take a, a sponsor which has no credibility in our audience, uh, being the journalist, then we get a problem, even if we are totally independent. And so we have to distinguish between independence risks and reputation risks. And we have also organizational risks, meaning that if an editor in our foundation, uh, in our institution doesn't like a, a donor, he may not uh, work or not uh, work uh, as uh, we like to do and or probably leave the institution. So we have an organizational risk. And therefore we kind of check these three different risks uh, for each potential donor in our team. And we evaluate every new founder according to this risk analysis. So here, just a little chart about our budget so far. So as I said, the Tostiero Foundation funded us uh, for five years and decided last year that she, uh, they will continue the funding for, for our institution. So it will, it will not stop. I think it's a little bit like in your two cases. So they committed in uh, giving us the funding so that our other funders at the moment, it's one uh, quarter of our total uh, budget um, is given by all the other funders which we have. And it's now 56 different uh, uh, sponsors besides the foundation. And you can see the amount of money we get from different uh, types of organization. Uh, at the moment, we just have uh, 16 full-time full employees and uh, we have uh, uh, guest scientists and uh, students uh, doing uh, lab and research and innovation in the SMC lab. So that is basically the, the structure. And uh, I wanted to say a few words about uh, what kind of funders do pioneers need. That's my lessons a little bit, maybe for other people too. So uh, I think you need somebody who uh, really gives you the chance to experiment and, and, and test what you are trying to achieve and take the time to do it. And um, yeah, of course you need the resources to do it. So you cannot just, uh, with a, a small amount of things, you cannot start a big, uh, huge and successful organization. We also started very small with three, four people starting and now uh, increasing every year. I think um, the donors, and in our case, the Klaus Tira Foundation, as you both uh, told us, we are totally independent. There is no influence whatsoever on any editorial decisions we do. And uh, they have great uh, confidence in the experiment we are uh, kind of doing. And I also like it, like a gardener who, who tries to grow his, uh, his plants in his garden. And uh, I think you can only create impact um, if you have the time that you can prove the impact. So if you expect an impact too early, then you cannot build an institution. And uh, maybe the last uh, slide I can show is uh, from Beate Spiegel. She's now the CEO of, of the Klaus Tierra Foundation. And uh, these are the three lessons she said she learned by funding institutions like our own. So the most important fund is to attract people who are committed to the realization of a good idea. So invest in people and not just uh, structures. And uh, inside the foundation that they decided uh, very quickly. So when we offered our proposal, it just took, I think, uh, not more than four months before they decided that they would do it. And then we could really start fast after the decision. So that was also quite uh, very important to start. And then uh, if the organization comes into being, they help us with all these things, which for, for example, for science journalists on an organizational way, it's not that easy to cover and they are very helpful in this respect. And then uh, they are very patient in uh, looking for the development of the organization. And I didn't show it now our, our impact data, but you can see that after five years of operation, we are, and especially now in the Corona pandemic, we get a lot of credibility from the news organizations who uh, work with us and work with our experts. And uh, so I would say after five years, I can see at least the experiment uh, shows that the Science Journalism Association uh, driven and uh, science journalism editorial office trying to get experts into the media system wherever it is, is a sensible undertaking. So that's for now. Thank you.
Thank you, Volker. So um, thanks for those um, three presentations. Um, I saw that some of you answered some more, uh, some questions already in the chat, but since we are um, recording this to have a reservoir of knowledge, I will ask you now two, three questions just to have a complete picture. And that would be the staff, for example. Could everybody of you just briefly tell us how many people do you have on your staff? Uh, Deborah, would you like to start? <coughs> Sure. <clears throat> Sorry. Dust. Um, Chaos and Jay has a staff of seven people. Um, and that includes both the full time UNDARC staffers, the part time UNDARC staffers, and the full time KSJ staffers. In addition, we have a dedicated freelance editorial staff of about six people. We have about four full time fact checkers, and we have two. Um, contributing writers. Hmm. That's our, our staff in place. Okay, and you did answer on the chat, but could you um, tell us again um, about your budget? Just the main uh, rough we'll idea. Calculate our whole budget at Undark at a baseline of a million a year US. Um, and we are usually over that, but you know, we'll never go under that. And I think I mentioned also in the chat, that our freelance budget had more than doubled since we started the magazine and it's probably closer to tripled. Uh, you know, we try to pay a, a good entry level uh, dollar per word uh, payment to freelancers because we know that people who are working as freelancers actually have to make a living. And so um, we try to increase our freelance budget for writers every year. Thank you. And um, Thomas, could you also um, add uh, how many of, I think I counted 12 people, but maybe this is not Perfect. the right number and the budget. Yes, it's uh, 12 full-time staff mm -hmm. on my team, uh, but we also have uh, dozens of freelancers. Uh, we have a few that are very regular freelance writers and then many more who, who write less fre frequently for us. Uh, we have um, a, a main uh, freelance copy editor. We have uh, fact checkers uh, that we work with. Uh, as well as many, many freelance artists, illustrators, photographers, um, animators, and, uh, and, and so it, it takes a, a lot of people. I like to say that the, uh, you know, publication is only as good as the people who produce it. So I, I very much appreciate what Volker just said about uh, the importance of, of finding the right people uh, to work on projects like this. I think that is uh, a, a very critical uh, point there. And in terms of, um, you know, funding, I think in general, like for the early on, it was just, you know, we started very small. So it was only a few hundred thousand dollars. Uh, for the budget, and then, uh, but the past few years, we've been between the two to three million um, uh, level for for annual budget. So this is how you could expand your stuff. And um, did you have to apply again and again at the Simon Foundation, or how did this work? Yeah, I saw a good question there in in the chat. Uh, um, so the the nice thing about being a foundation based um, publication is that um, I can talk directly with the leadership, and we can we can plan that out. So early on because it was still just a very new idea, we weren't sure it was gonna work. And I think the, you know, the foundation wasn't sure you know, if they're as, as committed to it yet until uh, you know, we sort of proved ourselves. Early on, it was more of a year by year, uh, but then after the first couple of years, it became, okay, things are going well. Now we have a three-year plan and then another three-year plan. And currently I'm working on a five-year plan. Okay, thank you. And um, Falka, you told us about your budget, but how many people are, are working yeah. at so we have uh, at the moment 16 people uh, full staff that is eight editors so eight science editors and eight people in the lab and then two people uh, assistant uh, and uh, all these office stuff going on so that's 16. Yeah and you showed that um, uh, yours you got the again money from the Klaus Tier Foundation for another five years right? No that's basically now it's a permanent model so we will get the permanent funding it's not restricted Okay. Um, so far, so uh, I think it's a little bit like uh, Deborah said, as long as I'm the chief editor, it will remain the same. If I'm no longer the chief editor, the new chief editor would have to manage, of course, to propose a perspective uh, uh, for the future. But for now, it's a, it's a kind of a per permanent commitment. From okay, the okay. Well, Thomas is looking a bit <laughs> nice. <laughs> that would be nice. Um, could you three please uh, tell me, you? Um, 
you, when you are planning to to grow or to expand, do you have to discuss this, or um, are you anyway anyhow are you planning? Thomas, you said you believe in sustainability. You don't want to grow at all costs. And um, what would you make to, um, get to the decision? Well, we have to grow. We have to get more for the stuff. And could you three just tell tell us briefly? Sure, I'm happy to just I guess continue that thought because I, I personally. Uh, believe that you know, as um, you know, as, as the person who's talking with the funders and making sure that you know we're able to show um, a level of impact for um, the input, um, you know, I feel it's important to to be able to to make that case um, uh, at any given time. And I think uh, it's it's easier to make that case and to and to ensure sustainability uh, when you grow with an actual. Um, well, first of all, to, to be able to make an accurate assessment of where you are uh, and then decide what you really need, what opportunities there are uh, in, in the current um, uh, you know, media landscape uh, for you to, to further your impact uh, and, and then decide, okay, do we need to grow? Because um, you know, I think also the, um, you know, the challenges of, of getting to a point where you, you grow too fast uh, are that you could potentially um, lose sight of, of of some of that that, that ratio. Mm -hmm. I, I like to think of it as a ratio between sort of impact mm -hmm. uh, uh, versus funding. Deborah, you are in a good position because you are the one um, who can. It seems to be easy for you. You can just say, "Well, we do need two more people on the staff. I will pay it." Right. Right. I mean, Tom Seller, the editor, and I have a discussion every year about how what we think the smartest way to grow on dark is, and we do want to continue to grow it. And so, I mean, we have something of a limit, which is what does the KSJ endowment, you know, provide us every year and how am I going to allocate those resources, right? Um, and, and so one of the things uh, that I've learned since I took this job is that you know, I'm sort of a budget bean counter in ways uh, that I wasn't before. Hmm. Thinking about, well, you know, how am I going to move this money around so that I can free up money here? And so I do a lot of that. And one of the things I have done is that I've raised money from foundations for other KSJ projects that then uh, frees up additional money for Undark. And, and, and I should emphasize that, you know, we are, we publish this magazine, but we also run a fellowship program. This year, we gave um, almost half a million dollars in grants to American science writers, you know, in a kind of remote fellowship ship project that we're doing during the COVID year. Uh, we hope it's one year. And, uh, so, you know, I'm also always looking at it in the terms of all the things that I think are important that we want to do. Undark is mm -hmm. one of the things we do, and it's one of the most important, but it's also important for us to support science journalism around the world in many other ways. Volker, um, yeah. are, you, are you thinking of growing? Do you, would you like to expand? Do you think it's important to expand? Yeah, well, in our case, one is the issue of the number of editors who are permanent staff, and that is basically the question of how many topics can we juggle. So we, we only go into topics where we have a good editor who is uh, kind of serious in that domain of uh, expertise. So we will not uh, help people with stuff we are not really familiar with. So that is one way to grow, to uh, go on to new scientific domains of expertise. So that's one. And then we have the other, which is a little bit unusual, maybe, and that's the SMC lab. And there we have a strategy to try to cooperate with researchers at universities and develop these tools together in uh, third party funding projects. And these can be kind of three years project, uh, which we uh, kind of uh, in a competition with others uh, trying to get at and then work on the tools we are wanting to work together with other scientists and uh, research institutions. So that's for the lab. The growth set strategy is a little bit to get uh, project-based funding to develop prototypes on new, new tools. And for the editorial office, it's more uh, important to have them kind of remote and uh, permanent stuff to work on the topics we want to work on. So it's basically that is the two things. And actually we started with, with 500,000 euros um, from the foundation. And then we had two stages where I proposed basically extensions 
uh, into these uh, lab activities and also new topics. Um, and therefore we grew a little bit. And I, I, I agree with, um, uh, with Quanta that uh, growth in itself, it doesn't mean anything. So we, we have to focus and, and look where you're going. And I think innovation in science journalism is also an interesting way to try to develop these new tools to do better uh, science journalism in the future. So that is one area I'm interested in personally, besides doing this service-oriented uh, topic-related stuff. Um, well, I guess it's, it's interesting for, um, for our audience. Um, if you have a recommendation, one of you or all three of you, how to find, well, how to find money, <laughs> how to find uh, a foundation or other means of money, uh, are there ideas that you tried in the beginning, but it didn't work out? Or are there ideas you just didn't have the time to follow or you didn't have to, Deborah, like, for example? Uh, could you say just a few um, brief sentences to this? Maybe Deborah, you would like to start? Yes, and so one of the things I would say, because I, we, I have raised money from a number of foundations, the Moore Foundation, the Cavalry Foundation, HHMI, uh, the Rita Allen Foundation, for different projects that we're doing. I mean, just to give you an example, we're going to put online this month a free guide to editing science. Uh, it's a handbook for science editors and that was funded by the Cavalry Foundation and HHMI. And so one of the things I've learned as I've worked with different foundations is how important it is to understand what the sweet spot is with that foundation, you know, what they're hoping to accomplish, what they see as their primary missions, and, and not just to take your, you know, your wonderful idea to a foundation thinking, you know, okay, they've never done this before, or this is not in their normal ballpark, but I'm sure they'll love this. You really have to research the foundations and, and understand the directions that they're taking. I mean, you can encourage them in new directions if you have a good working relationship. And that's the other thing that I've learned from working with foundations is, you know, personal relationships matter, right? And you really have to respect the fact that many foundations these days are investing in good science journalism and to think about the ways that they want to do it. I mean, I will tell you when I saw that the Knowable, um, Knowable had gotten you know, a, a, you know, very supportive grant from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. I thought, oh, why didn't I ask them if they would do X, mm. right? So, you know, you <laughs> also have to pay attention to mm. <laughs> Okay. Thomas, oh. you, I saw you nodding when, when Deborah said that um, it's important to have a personal relationship or you have to, to research before the, the sweet spot of a foundation. What do yeah. you think? All, all of that. And, and, you know, even though I, I haven't had to go to multiple sources, you know, to, to get funding in that way. It was really my pitch to, to one foundation and I was already uh, there uh, working there. So I had access to, to all the people to talk to and, and could sort of, and I had a sense of the, it took, you know, honestly, it was an exchange. So, so I, even though I, I said before that, you know, scientists don't really know how journalism works. I didn't know how foundations worked. I mean, I had never worked at a foundation before. I, I hadn't even, I had never heard of the Science Foundation before they reached out to me. And so, you know, this is all new to me, but, but understanding uh, what their concerns were and also um, given the, the ability to do independent journalism, but still aligning your um, vision and your mission in a way that um, makes sense for them is, is critical, right? Because you have to think, I mean, why, why would somebody you know, fund something that, especially something they can't control <laughs> unless um, there was something that they felt was benefiting uh, their mission as well. And so uh, I think that that's critical. And then also there, there was a, a good question, follow-up question about um, funding and expansion. Like how do you get people to then fund an expansion as well? Like when we, it wasn't, it wasn't five to 12, I think it was six to 12, like doubled our, our, our staff at one point. Um, it, I think one thing is that once you've already built something that's um, that's doing well and that you've you've done the initial startup work, actually you can you can get a lot more bang for the buck by adding a certain amount of staff to fill that out. Like we were understaffed, I should say, for many years. So it's not that you know five or six really was. I mean, you know, we had people wearing multiple hats. It's you know something. It's more of that early startup environment. And so, but once you've built something that you can then say this is successful. 
but we need to build it out further. And actually the amount of investment for filling out the rest of that staffing will actually get you a big boost in terms of reach and, and impact. Um, that is actually much more um, cost effective than that initial uh, startup period. Okay, Walker, uh, what would you recommend? Yeah. Yeah, in my case, uh, it was a little bit unusual because it was very personal. So I met Klaus Tira, uh, who was basically the founder of the Klaus Tira Foundation personally. And he was a very avid consumer of journalism. And he had many concerns about the way it's going and whether it's right. And, and uh, therefore, he was involved in science communication. And I could convince him that uh, investing in good science journalism is a good way of uh, giving uh, science a uh, more profound role in uh, in the uh, public debates, and um, I think the most crucial point uh, was that he had to understand that to be successful for that such an uh, organization had to be independent, and that's the point he got. So he understood that it could not work if he every day comes into the office and says, "Well, do this, do that. Can you can't you do this?" So he really deeply understood that this editorial independence is kind of the only way to generate trust in our organization by, uh, with our journalists or the, or the, or the audience. Hmm. I think that was very important. So you have in a way to, to yeah, like Deborah said, you have to, to come into uh, contact, you have to present, not just say, well, do what I want, but you have to be in a very interesting conversation and the people have strong opinions and you have to discuss and find a common ground but not giving up your principles. I mean, and that's what I did and that succeeded in this case. And then now there was a question about fundraising. Uh, yeah, well, that's a problem. We have these uh, 56 uh, um, donors and basically it's also kind of a personal thing. So it's no real structure uh, so far behind it because it's also kind of personal. You have to convince every new donor basically by explaining what you do, why you do it, why it's necessary, why it's important. And uh, basically that is, um, that is done on certain occasions, but we don't have a fundraiser for that at the moment. So basically that's, uh, I, I'm doing it in a way when I, can, when I have the time to do it, but it is just an addition. And as we have this main foundation giving us the, the basic funding, um, we can basically grow organically with the, with the rest of the funding. Mm -hmm. And we write uh, competitive grants for, for research funding, of course, yeah. That's another area where we can make a difference. So you all three um, really um, emphasize the point or stress the point that you have, it's, it's a personal thing to, to find the right foundation, the right founder. And also that um, for you all three, it's very important to be editorial independent. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but briefly, I'd like to mention one point because there, Volker Stollers differs a bit from Deborah Bloom and Thomas Lynn, which is that Volker Stollers is not um, creating stories himself, but he helps journalists to write stories which they can sell. I, I, I put it bluntly now. And um, the, the, the model of uh, Qantas Magazine and um, Undark Org are different because you do co cooperate, you say, but doesn't it mean that um, journalists get paid by you and um, um, well, which is fine, but they are by uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Science Magazine, whatever. They don't have to pay for this kind of journalism. Don't you think that in the future this will, well, not destroy science journalism, but it will diminish it? Maybe you guys want to start, Deborah or Thomas? Are you asking, Christina, uh, if it's a problem that we allow people to republish our stuff for free? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Because they yeah. could get used to getting free stories. <laughs> yes. I mean, I will say that I haven't seen the New York Times pick up any of our stuff to my sorrow, right? Um, you know, I think that that's a legitimate point. It's one of the reasons that we, uh, you know, pay our writers as well as we can. And, and we also allow them to keep the copyright so that if they, you know, want to sell it elsewhere after a certain period of time, they can do that as well. Um, not every nonprofit is a steal our stuff model. I don't think Quanta is pro public. No, we're not. Right, right. We we do we do syndicate, but we do it on a more of an exclusive basis where we we work specifically with um, other uh, partner publications to syndicate. So, and we don't not everything even gets syndicated necessarily. Like I don't, I don't think we. I think in the early years it was more important in terms of getting the word out. 
Um, but we also like like Debra, we we pay writers quite well, often better than than some of the say, you know, newspapers especially, uh, yes. and maybe some magazines as well. And so it's really one piece that's being written, and it's just being shared. So it's not necessarily it's not that um, anybody is working for free. I so agree. you don't okay. So you don't fear that um, they could get well used to it and they just pick up your stories and they don't have to hire any science journalists anymore. No, I mean, it's interesting because some of the publications, oh, we've had this conversation about a few of the national publications that have picked up a lot of our stuff. Like, are we you know, giving them too much free stuff and should we set limits on how much you can republish? But that undermines what I think is the other thing we're trying to accomplish with this which is that if you go across the landscape of the United States, and if you look in particular at what people tend to call the red states, uh, you know, the more conservative rural states, mm -hmm. they don't have science journalists. They don't have science journalism and often they can't afford to do it. So we feel that it's in our best interest and, and the best interest of, of, you know, a science literate American public to try to make this as available to those. And we actually, our marketing director will reach out directly to small newspapers um, or regional newspapers if we're doing a story that we think has some implications in that area and say, we just want to let you know that this is available if you want to publish it, because we see that one of the things we want UNDART to do is try to get good science journalism into these underserved markets. Okay, we are nearly at the end. I'm sorry, but we have one more really important, interesting question. So if each of you would just answer in a very brief matter. And the question is, what's your recommendation for ensuring journalistic independence when you are foundation-based, um, fi financed? Um, well, Deborah, just go ahead. You, you're just in the middle of the screen. Yes, well, I mean, I, I'm a longtime science journalist and UNDERC is, uh, you know, my, uh, one of the things I started at KSJ and I see it as my mission to protect it and keep it independent. And when we have had occasional times where MIT, you know, has wanted, has wondered why we don't cover MIT, say, and, and I've just blocked all of that, right? So I think it's important for, the person at the foundation that's themselves, I'm gonna describe myself briefly as a foundation funder. I think it's important to understand that from the beginning and had to have your foundation understand, you know, that you that the value of your publication is in its independence and they support that. Thank you. Volker? Yeah, actually my point would be that um, look at our products. So if you see any, uh, any hint of uh, not independent uh, from some donors, funders, whatever, please tell us. So please judge us from our products we, we, we sell. And uh, that is a, uh, not so we don't sell them, but we just give it away. But please uh, look at it and look for spots and tell us. So we get feedback by the people. But the other thing was we were basically funded uh, and organized outside the science journalism community. And there was a lot of concern about this uh, independence. Of course, people were concerned. Are we going to be independent? So for me, that's written in my DNA. I'm a science journalist. So as long as I'm the head of that center, it couldn't be otherwise. And I, I totally agree with Deborah. And if you want to get funding, you have to make that co completely clear that you will not do it. I mean, the funder has to understand that this is a, a condizio sine qua non. Without, uh, you can't do it. I mean, I wouldn't do it. So basically, that is a problem, of course, but you have to be very clear on, on what you want to achieve. Danger. Thomas, would you like to add something? Yeah, no, I think this goes right back to sort of who you choose to, to uh, lead an enterprise like this. Because if you do get somebody who is a journalist who understands the importance of this, um, they're going to stick by their principles and, and, and to, you know, sort of these uh, journalistic standards because that's ultimately what uh, the public needs to, to tr be able to trust what you're um, uh, reporting and, and producing. And that's ultimately what will allow the project to succeed. Um, and so, you know, ultimately if, if uh, and I, I'll say that there are um, uh, foundation funded publications that may be sort of more of a hybrid, right? That aren't as fully independent as, as maybe um, you know, some of us are, are trying to, to keep ours. And so it really does depend who 
I think the leadership is and, and, uh, and uh, how they're able to, to sort of maintain that independence. Okay, so now we really have to close. I want to thank you um, very, very much, Deborah Bloom, Thomas Lynn, and Volker Stolitz for your presentation, for all the answers and the discussion. Thank you very much. And um, well, thanks for, um, uh, for all the people in the audience who gave input in the chat. And um, as we told before, there will be a reservoir of knowledge in um, where you will won't be tomorrow, but in a few days, um, we, you can see the, the session and all the other sessions um, that have, have taken place already. So thank you very much and greetings wherever you are. <laughs>